CanCOVID is an open science collective dedicated to rapidly mobilizing and sharing knowledge to help inform Canada's COVID-19 response. To learn more about us or how to join our community, you can visit our website at cancovid.ca. That's great. I think we'll get started. Good afternoon or good morning, everyone, depending on where you are. I'm delighted to be here. My name is Susan Law. I'm the Managing Director at CanCOVID. And today we have a pretty special uh, presentation for you today by a number of people. It's the first public presentation about the results of the um, major national uh, Canadian seroprevalence study. And I'm welcoming uh, Dr. Tim Evans, Jennifer Servet, uh, Stephen Earl, David Buckridge, and Catherine Hankins. So thank you very much for everyone for joining us today. And I will turn it over to Dr. Evans to give us a start. Great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Susan, and uh, we're grateful to CanCOVID for the opportunity to present um, uh, the final results from uh, Canada's most representative seroprevalence study, uh, which has uh, been a product of uh, StatsCan and uh, with support from uh, uh, the COVID-19 Immunity Task Force. Um, I'm going to make a few brief comments to get things started. We'll hear the results uh, from uh, uh, Jennifer and will uh, Steve will then uh, uh, Jennifer and Steve from um, uh, uh, the study um, uh, will provide the results. David Buckridge from the COVID-19 Immunity Task Force will give us a bigger picture assessment, and then Dr. Catherine Hankins, uh, who is our co-chair of the COVID-19 Immunity Task Force, will uh, round things up. Um, uh, with a few summary remarks. So uh, just to move forward, this is a little bit about uh, the uh, COVID-19 Immunity Task Force. Uh, we have a, a leadership group, uh, which is a volunteer uh, uh, enterprise with experts comprising experts across the country in a broad set of areas of, 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 of relevance to the pandemic and uh, the immune dimensions of it. Uh, Catherine uh, Hankins is uh, joined by David Naylor as one of the co-chairs. Uh, we have ex officio members from the Government of Canada through PHAC, CIHR, the Office of the Chief Scientific Advisor to the Prime Minister, representatives of the Provincial and Territorial Ministries of Health and McGill University. And I have the opportunity of uh, leading the Secretariat uh, based at McGill University. Thanks. Next. Yeah, so this is the mandate of the task force we established over a year ago in April 2020 and uh, really to support uh, development and implementation of relevant research um, uh, that uh, aligns studies across Canada uh, and uh, uh, with an effort to provide useful and timely information to federal, provincial and territorial decision makers in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. Next. Uh, these are the priority areas of research for uh, the task force, uh, seroprevalence studies, which is what we'll be focusing on today. But in addition to those, uh, we've been looking at, at uh, immune science, uh, a ra dynamic area, uh, rapidly evolving in terms of our understanding the nature of immunity arising from infection and now vaccines, uh, and then immune testing. Uh, how do we understand the level uh, uh, of uh, of immunity uh, through antibody tests or other tests of the immune system. Uh, and then uh, as vaccines have come into uh, uh, circulation, uh, how do we uh, monitor uh, the effectiveness and safety of vaccines? So those are the, the spectrum of areas. Uh, thus far, we've uh, funded almost 100 studies across the country. And as you can see from this map, uh, we've really tried to focus on coast to coast to coast in terms of the uh, distribution and representativeness of the studies um, for the task force. Next. Uh, we're focusing on serology today. And so in many respects, um, this is uh, an incredibly important complement to uh, acute infection testing, which is what has been primarily used to track uh, and monitor the epidemic in Canada and elsewhere. And those are uh, by and large uh, acute infections identified through the RT-PCR swab. But 
uh, serology really helps us get below the water line and understand uh, how big the iceberg is underneath. Uh, and that relates to the fact that a lot of people uh, with sniffles or symptoms that they don't associate with uh, COVID don't get tested, uh, that a significant portion of people um, have a symptomatic uh, infection and that many people simply don't have access to testing. And so by testing uh, serology, we really get uh, serological testing. We get a sense of the size of the iceberg um, uh, and a full, uh, lar full extent of the COVID-19 pandemic. Next. Um, this is uh, the StatsCan survey. It's one of um, uh, many uh, seroprevalence surveys, but in, in many respects, what we did initially was we took advantage of existing platforms like blood uh, banks uh, to understand um, uh, the frequency of antibodies in, in, in those in blood donors, for example, or another uh, non-representative samples. Uh, we felt it was very important, however, to work with StatCan to get uh, a representative sample of Canadians. And so this study really provides us with uh, Canadians one year of age and up uh, from all 10 provinces and three territories, rural and urban, and uh, those who may or may not be uh, in good health. Uh, 11,000 Canadians from across the country participated uh, in this study. Next. Over to uh, Jennifer Survey and Stephen Earle, who are going to give us the results of the study. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jennifer Sarvet, and I'm one of the unit ed with the Center of Population Health Data at Statistics Canada that contributed to the Canadian COVID-19 Antibody and Health Survey. It's been a pleasure collaborating with COVID-19 Immunity Task Force, the Public Health Agency of Canada, and Health Canada on this exciting and important project over the past year. We are very excited about our successful partnership that led to the elaboration and implementation of this survey. It's a strong demonstration of SATSCAN's effort toward our collective understanding of COVID-19 and its impact on Canadians and our society. So normally for us, a survey initiative of this nature would have taken a minimum of 24 to 30 months to plan, collect, and disseminate. Thanks to a strong and coordinated effort from many partners, such as the CITF, El Canada's Research Ethic Board, the National Microbiology Lab from FAC, other key laboratories, and relevant internal service partners at Statistics Canada, we were able to conduct the survey rapidly and are proud to share the first results from this survey with you today. So after many brainstorming sessions and consultation with the CATF and within Statistics Canada, CCAS was created with the main goal of better understand the actual spread of the virus in Canada by estimating the number of Canadians one and up who have developed antibodies in their blood nationally and for each province and territory, better understand the social demographics of those who have developed antibodies in their blood, and better understand how many asymptomatic Canadians have antibodies in their blood, who they are, and their symptoms and testing history. Canadians aged 1 to 24 year old were selected using the Canadian Child Benefit Frame, or a combination of the Child Benefit Frame and the Census Frame. Canadians aged 25 and up were selected with the Age Order Selection Method using the Dwelling Universe Frame. The collection of the survey was divided in four waves. Wave one was launched with a small sample to allow us to pilot the survey and have a better understanding of response rates and shipping times. Wave two and three consisted of the bulk of the survey, while wave four was launched to strengthen the sample representation from Nunavut. So the dry blood spot method was used to determine if respondents to CCAS had antibodies to the SARS-CoV-2 virus. The pictures on this slide demonstrate the material used for CCAS. The DBS kits were provided by the CITF, and the CITF, in col collaboration with the National Laboratory for HIV Reference Services, initiated an evaluation of several serological testing platforms using a common panel of DBS. From this panel, promising platforms were identified for extensive validation, and two platforms were selected to be used for analyzing the CCAS DBS kits. So on this uh, slide, the green line represents the response rates of those who completed the electronic questionnaire. 
while the bars represent the overall response rates, meaning those who completed both the electronic questionnaire and DBS portion of the survey. The IS overall response rate was in the eight to 14 year old with 28%, while the lowest response rate was in the one to seven year old at 18%. This slide shows the response rates by territory and provinces. So the overall response rates were similar across provinces and territories with the exception of Nunavut. Uh, on average, most provinces were mid to uh, I 20%. So to make the data representative of the Canadian, popula of the Canadian population, weights were created. So weights are modified to take into account non-response to the questionnaire. And then an adjustment to the weight is done in order to reduce bias. bias. Counts of, having, of persons having received a positive test is matched to official provincial counts. And then using the information present on the questionnaire, a second set of non-response adjustments are made to take into account non-response to the dry blood spot. Finally, the weights are calibrated to official demographic counts like age, sex by provinces and territories, and CMA, non-CMA by age. On top of the weights that were created, an extra variance adjustment was completed to account for the sensitivity and specificity of the antibody laboratory test. In some estimates, the weighting as well as the variance adjustment were used to develop the estimates, estimates and confidence interval. So I will turn it over to Stephen to continue the presentation as well as present the results to you. Thank you, Jen. My name is Stephen Earle and I was the lead analyst for the COVID-19 antibody and health survey for Statistics Canada. And I'm gonna take you through the results. But before I do that, just a quick definition of some of the concepts that we uh, will be presenting today, just to give you a little bit more perspective on what exactly these numbers mean. So, uh, for respondents that participated in the test, they could have received one of three possible results, a positive result, an indeterminate result, or a negative result. And this was based on the, uh, their seropositivity to one or more of three different antigen tests that were performed on their sample. So someone who was considered to be uh, overall positive had two or more of the three antigen tests being positive. These three antigens were the spike protein, the receptor binding domain, and the nucleocapsid. An indeterminate test result was determined to be one out of three antigens being positive, while a negative result was zero out of three antigens being positive from their test. So for the overall seroprevalence uh, estimate, the numerator in this case is the number of positive laboratory results, while the denominator is anyone with a valid test result. So that is anyone who was negative, positive, or indeterminate. There were a couple of reasons why a person may have had uh, an invalid test result, mainly because their sample did not pass a QC test that was performed, or if they submitted a blood sample that was not of sufficient quantity to complete the test. Looking at vaccine-induced seroprevalence, this was specifically people who were spike and receptor binding domain positive. So that's spike and receptor binding domain positive and nucleocapsid negative. And uh, had reported in their questionnaire that they had been vaccinated. So really when we talk about vaccine-induced seroprevalence, we're referring to vaccine-only induced seroprevalence. There were a few people in our survey who were both, appeared to be both vaccine-induced, uh, had, had both vaccine-induced seroprevalence and seroprevalence due to infection. These people were included in our infection estimates. And now our results nationally, we're gonna go over the results overall by sex and then by age group, as well as a breakdown by sex and age group together. So overall, we observed a serial prevalence in the population of 3.6%, of which 1% was due to vaccine induced and further 2.6% was due to previous infection. When looking at the results by sex, they were similar by sex, however, slightly higher in females at 3.9% compared to males at 3.3%. One of the things that we uncovered in our survey was that females were significantly more likely to report having been vaccinated over the survey period. And that was reflected in the vaccine-induced seroprevalence observed from the laboratory test data. 
females had a zero prevalence due to vaccination at 1.5% overall, and this compared to 0.4% in males. With that said, infection acquired zero prevalence again was similar between the sexes. However, the estimate for males was slightly higher at 2.8% compared to females at 2.4%. On the right side of the screen, you can see the estimates by age group. For the 1 to 19 age group, we observed an overall zero prevalence of 3.4%. And the overwhelming majority of this was due to infection. As I'm sure you know, during the survey period of November to early April, one to 19 year olds were not uh, priorities for vaccination. And in most cases, they were not eligible for vaccination either. When looking at the 20 to 59 age group and the 60 plus age group, we observed overall serial prevalences of 2 point, or sorry, 4.5% and 2.1% respectively. Within these two groups, Approximately one in every three adults with antibodies had them due to vaccination already. Before I move on, it's important to mention that in the 60 plus estimate, who we're really referring to is the 60 plus population living in private households. The survey methodology did not include 60 plus populations living in institutional settings such as long term care or retirement centers. Here are the same results that you've just noticed except broken out by age group and sex. One thing that kind of stands out right away is that in the under 60 population, estimates were generally higher than in the 60 plus population. And specifically with regards to working age females, age 20 to 59, they were significantly higher as determined by a statistical test than the 60 plus populations. Now moving on to the regional and provincial results. So starting on the top left hand of the screen, you see the overall serial prevalence in the territories was 21.1% or approximately one in five territorial residents overall. The entirety of this estimate was due to vaccination. In fact, in this survey, we did not encounter a single territorial resident who had antibodies due to a previous infection. Moving on to British Columbia, we observed an overall serial prevalence of 2.4%, Alberta 5.6, Saskatchewan 4.1, Manitoba 3.1, Ontario 3.3, and in Quebec 4.4. Now the numbers presented uh, below are for the overall estimates one and over, but for these regions in particular from British Columbia to Quebec, what we noticed that again was approximately one in three adults had antibodies due to vaccination. However, the same could not be said for the Atlantic region. First, Atlantic Canada had a lower overall serial prevalence at 1.3% total. And in the adult population in this region, two thirds, as opposed to one third, two thirds of antibodies were due to vaccination already at this point. So these again are the same numbers that you just saw, but were broken out by sex. And what you can see is that it's hard to determine a trend by sex within the population. Of course, in the Atlantic region, the numbers are lower and in the territories region, the numbers are higher due to the higher prevalence of vaccination in that region at the time. Uh, one thing that I can note is that with the exception of the Atlantic and the Alberta region, generally speaking, it appeared that females had a higher serial prevalence than males. However, as you can see with the wide breadth of the confidence intervals that were in the, in the slide, drawing conclusions from this data was difficult when del delving down to this level of detail. And again, the same thing can be said when looking at the same provinces and regions by age group. Um, so again, results were lowest in the Atlantic and highest in the territories. And uh, we did notice that again, uh, for the 60 plus population, it appeared to be higher in Saskatchewan and Alberta. But again, due to the wide confidence intervals that we observed, drawing conclusions from this level of detail was somewhat difficult. So that being said, we're gonna move back into national estimates and we're gonna be looking at occupational risk as well as indigenous status and visible minority status. So for occupational risk, on the left-hand side of the screen are two numbers that you've already seen. They are the overall serial prevalence estimate at 3.6% as well as the vaccine inquired serial prevalence at 1% overall. The next two refer to public facing jobs or as described in the survey, individuals who reported working in direct contact with others. We observed a 5.1% prevalence estimate 
of which 2.4% overall was due to vaccination. This compares to others who did not work in direct contact with others or who reported not working, who had a zero prevalence estimate overall at 2.5% and a 0.4% zero prevalence due to vaccination. Moving on to national estimates by, estimates by population group. Again, on the left, to orient yourself, you see the national estimates. The next two refer to the indigenous population of Canada. And this really refers to the indigenous population living outside of reserves or other indigenous settlements. Their estimate was 3.2% overall, of which 1.1% was due to vaccination. And this compares very similar to the other side of the screen where you see the rest of the population. That really refers to the white only population in Canada, which observed a zero positive estimate of 3.3% and 1.2% due to vaccination. These compared to the visible minority statistic, which was slightly higher for overall at 4.8%, while the estimate for vaccine acquired zero prevalence in the visible minority population was lower at 0.5% overall. So when looking at these numbers by infection then, we observed approximately a 4.3% infection rate or zero prevalence due to infection in the visible minority population. And this compared to a zero prevalence estimate of approximately 2.1% in the remainder of the population. And this difference was statistically significant. So for zero prevalence in people who never got a PCR test. So one of the questions that we asked in our survey was if an individual had ever got a PCR test, which is a nose or throat nasal swab test. And what we found was that uh, among those who had antibodies due to a past infection, one in three, about one in three, reported never having taken a PCR test at any point in the pandemic. So for anyone who not reported having a PCR test done, we followed up with them and asked why that was so. And among this particular subgroup of people, we noticed that three and four reported never having symptoms. And that leads us to our topics to explore for further analysis. So these are areas that are, we are looking to explore for further possible analysis, sample size permitting. We're looking at the electronic questionnaire and what we can pull out of it. For example, demographics or self-reported health status, for example, general health, mental health, or uh, chronic conditions, which the individual may have. We're looking at COVID related questions such as symptoms, tests, vaccinations, as well as preventative measures taken. We're looking at occupational uh, characteristics. For example, we can take a deeper dive past whether or not an individual reported working in a public facing position. We can look at type of household, for example, the number of people living in the household or whether they lived in, for example, a single family home or an apartment. And we can also look at household income. We're looking to dive deeper into the dried blood spot it's test itself with the help of the CITF in the interpretation of the results. And again, sample size permitting, we're looking at the electronic questionnaire and DBS together, looking at potentially asymptomatic infections by age, as well as visible minority and by public facing work. So thank you so much for your time. I'm not going to pass the presentation on to Dr. Buckridge, who will continue for us. Thank you very much, Stephen. So it's my pleasure to present to you the results of the immunity monitoring work that is going on uh, at the CITF Secretariat. The goal of this work is to take estimates uh, like you just saw reported by the Statistics Canada group and combine them with estimates from other studies, along with epidemiologic indicators, so that we have regular estimates of the cumulative proportion of Canadians with immunity to SARS-CoV-2. So as you will recall, the uh, results you just heard reported were collected uh, earlier this year in, in the January through to February range. Uh, and so we're pulling those results together with other results, and we're going to show you our model-based results in terms of uh, immunity from infection and from vaccination through to the end of May 31st, 2021. Uh, next slide, please. I'd just like to acknowledge that this work is led by the CITF Data Management Analytics Group within the Secretariat, uh, but we have support for model development implementation from a number of sources, including Precision Analytics, Zero Tracker, uh, and uh, the, the uh, Professor Dave Stevens in Math and Statistics at McGill University. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, the approach that we're taking with this, uh, this modeling work for monitoring immunity is to try and triangulate the sporadic seroprevalence results that come from different studies, like the study that we're talking about today, along with other seroprevalence results from other studies and the regular epidemiologic indicators, 
so that we can estimate the cumulative proportion uh, of the population that has some immunity to SARS-CoV-2. And so we're really exploiting is this relationship between immunity and previous infection along with vaccination. The approach is to build uh, on a published model uh, that was published towards the end of last year. It's an ensemble Bayesian statistic model of geographic regions. And what that means is we're fitting a series of linked models to different provinces or collections of regions in the case of the Atlantic provinces. Uh, and the inputs there are daily mortality data, cumulative age sex death counts, excluding those uh, who die in long-term care facilities, and seroprevalence results. Some infection fatality ratios are provided as input, but for the most part, those infection fatality ratios are inferred by the model and provide us with another way of, of uh, validating our, our model results. So I'll come back to that later in the presentation. To incorporate data on vaccination, we bring in vaccine coverage data, along with data on efficacy of the vaccines by product and dose. So next slide, please. And so this shows you the result overall for Canada, again, up until the end of May 31st, 2021. The estimate at that point for seroprevalence, which is the dark blue line or teal line at the center, is 5.4% with a confidence interval, as you can see. Uh, the 50% credible interval is the darker shaded area, and then the lighter shaded area is the 95% credible interval. So that's the overall result for Canada. Oh, that was, sorry, just to back up one second, that's just from natural infection. And so you can see the numbers are a little higher than we reported before from the CIS Canada survey, but we're a few months later, of course. Next slide, please. So now we're showing the model results where we're pulling together the data from the Ciro survey results, along with data from vaccine coverage uh, and data on vaccination. So the red line you see, or the red area at the bottom, is essentially the plot I showed you on the previous slide. That's from that's immunity from uh, infection with the virus. Then in the blue or teal shaded area, that's the immunity induced by vaccination. And then based on certain assumptions about the covariance of those two, we're showing you the white area, which is the overall immunity in the population from all sources. And we're estimating that at the end of May to be approximately 45% as you can see there. Now, as I mentioned, this Canada-wide estimate comes from rolling up estimates uh, in different provinces and regions. So if we go to the next slide, I can illustrate for you uh, what this looks like in, for two different provinces, Alberta and Ontario. Alberta on the left, Ontario on the right. And so you're seeing very similar plots. The difference is now the points you see on the plots overlaid are the results from seroprevalence surveys that have been incorporated into the model. The vertical blue or teal shading above the dots indicates the temporal interval or range of the zero survey. So you can get a scent, uh, get a scent, sorry, the temporal support uh, for those points. And so what you can see on the left for Alberta is that we have an estimate of overall immunity from all sources at the end of May of 41.9%. And the red line shows, or the red area shows that a relatively small proportion of that, 5.8%, is attributable to infection with the virus. You can also see I'm highlighting the Statistics Canada result that was just reported of 4%, and it fits actually fairly neatly onto the red line in this case for Alberta. On Ontario, you see a relatively similar picture again, uh, where the overall estimate of immunity again is quite comparable to Alberta at the end of May, 45.4%, and also similar numbers of uh, uh, people who have immunity from natural infection. The estimate from Siskena is a little bit lower there, 2.5%, but was in line, in fact, with the other seroprevalence results you can see there, which for the most part are from uh, Canadian Blood Services, but from other individual studies as well. Now, if we go to the next slide, you can see a bit of a different story when we compare Manitoba to the Atlantic provinces. So uh, what's quite striking here is that in Manitoba, you can see the large amount of the red area is quite large, showing that in fact, a lot or a significant proportion of the immunity in that population is due to infection with the virus, 13.7% in Manitoba. Uh, whereas the overall level of immunity is 47.5%. On the right, in the Atlantic provinces, you can see that there's very little immunity in, in the, that population attributable to infection with the virus, 0.8%, uh, whereas the overall level of immunity of 39.3%, which incorporates combines that immunity from that, uh, viral infection along with immunity from vaccination, at 39.3% is actually relatively high, but almost entirely due to vaccination. Uh, next slide, please. So if we compare across the, uh, the country, I'm showing you the same results now for all the, diff all the provinces uh, and Canada. So the Canadian value is on the far left, and the numbers that correspond to the Canadian value are shown on the right. So again, you've seen that before. 
the proportion uh, of immune, of course, the population with uh, immunity from infection, we estimate 5.4% again at the end of May 31st, 2021, and vaccination and infection about 44.9%. And you can see that uh, the, some of the prairie provinces, Saskatchewan and Manitoba, tend to have higher estimates, both in terms of infection uh, from virus and also through uh, vaccine. Uh, and then we see that the values start to drop off a bit as we get into the Atlantic provinces and also to some extent Quebec. But that gives you a sense of the variation based on our modeling results of the uh, level of immunity due to, as I mentioned, infection of the virus and through vaccination. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, we do a number of steps to try and validate our model results. And I also want to say a few words about the limitations of the approach that we're using here. The plot on the left is showing you the estimated infection fatality ratios. So that's the ratio, essentially the proportion of people who become infected. This is not confirmed cases. This is all infections who end up dying from infection with SARS-CoV-2. And as you can see on a log scale, it's a relatively linear increase across the age groups. Uh, and we do see higher infection fatality rates in males, particularly in the 50 to 59, 60, 69, 70, 79 age groups. These age-specific IFRs are, are, are quite similar, actually, to the age-specific IFRs reported in the, in the literature, uh, which gives us some confidence that we're doing a good job in terms of um, our models doing a good job, I should say, in terms of uh, triangulating between the zero survey results and the uh, other epidemiologic indicators we include. Uh, in addition to looking at, at infection fatality rate ratio, we can also look at age-specific mortality and, and ensure that we're fitting that correctly in terms of the model. Uh, we can look at cumulative seroconversion and also cumulative infections uh, as they're generated by other modeling groups. And in fact, that is work that is ongoing in terms of comparing this result to other modeling activities, both in Canada and internationally. Limitations I should mention, uh, although we have a number of, rep of, of seroprevalence estimates, there are a relatively small number of representative seroprevalence estimates available. Uh, and this, of course, points to the, the, the great value of the, of the results you're hearing today from Statistics Canada, because it is a quite a representative survey they've done. Uh, the model that we're using right now does not account for zero reversion, uh, and so that may in fact result in a slight underestimate potentially uh, in our model. We also uh, have not adjusted all assay results to a common reference panel. We've done our best to do that statistically with the uh, data that's available, but uh, better, better adjustment could probably be done, and that's something we're looking at for the future. Uh, there are also efforts to adjust for sampling bias in the different zero surveys, but they're, they're not always done the same way, and so that is another uh, methodologic limitation that we're looking at addressing in the future as well. Next slide, please. Um, so in terms of next steps for the immunity monitoring, as I mentioned, this is something the CITF Secretariat is reporting on monthly. This is our second report now, and we'll be uh, putting those reports up on our, our website as soon as they're prepared uh, or available for posting. But the next steps you can see that we're, we're taking fall into these three areas. The first is to enhance the modeling of infection and vaccine uh, vaccination covariance. As I mentioned, we do try to adjust for that. Uh, but it's a little difficult to, to understand exactly what that covariance is. I think some information can come from surveys like the one you heard about today. It's also possible to use linked data where some provinces are able to link their testing data to their, um, to their, their uh, vaccination data and give us estimates directly of that covariance. Uh, and we also can start to be more sophisticated in how we use the different types of antigen results, whether it's spike or nucleocapsid, for example, to tease apart uh, the different aspects of uh, whether this, the infection is likely due to uh, infection with the virus or to vaccination. The second area is to improve adjustment of seroprevalence estimates, as I mentioned already, for sampling biases and assay characteristics. And then finally, we want to improve our estimation of true infections. And so this uh, currently we're, we're using only mortality data together with um, the zero survey results. And we'll be bringing in uh, other uh, time series epidemiologic indicators such as cases, confirmed cases and hospitalizations. And then finally, also uh, incorporate into our model uh, an ability to essentially correct for zero reversion. Uh, and then next slide, please. So to summarize, uh, the immunity modeling I'm reporting uh, to you today, the point here is to synthesize and triangulate multiple data sources. So adding value to the different zero survey results that are available, while at the same time bringing them together in a coherent whole along with epidemiologic indicators. So we can really get an estimate from all sources of what's our, what do we think cumulative zero uh, conversion is or zero prevalence. The initial estimates I showed you indicate low levels of natural immunity, particularly in some regions of Canada. But as I said, that variation does occur across the provinces and regions. And in 
pretty much all regions, vaccination is now the main source of immunity. Updated estimates, as I mentioned, will be released on a monthly basis, incorporating new serum prevalence results to become available and vaccination data and also the ongoing refinements to the model. And I'll now pass it back to Dr. Hankins. Thank you. And I can see a really active chat going on. So we'll have a, a good discussion question when we get to that period. Next slide, please. So uh, these are just some of the take home messages from today. It, this study, we call it CCAS, Statistic Canada's Canadian COVID-19 Antibody Health Survey, showed that antibody levels were very low going into the third wave. We were kind of sitting ducks for that third wave in a sense. Children and adolescents were more likely to have infection acquired immunity than Canadians 60 years and over living outside long-term care. These are our community living seniors. They obviously were isolating and wearing masks and avoiding contact because they had the lowest rates. Children and adolescents did not have access at that point to vaccines. And so what we're seeing is infection acquired antibodies only in them. The public facing workers uh, had more infection acquired immunity, understandably, and they had higher vaccine induced immunity than others because they were prioritized in the first quarter of the year. Canadians belonging to visible minorities were twice as likely to have infection acquired immunity and half as likely to have vaccine induced immunity than others. And I know there has been work in several provinces to try to address this discrepancy in terms of vaccine uptake. So if we look at the actual numbers of asymptomatic infections, we see, first of all, that one in three Canadians with infection-induced antibodies had never taken a PCR test. And think back to the iceberg that Tim Evans showed at the start. Three out of four of them didn't take a test because they had no symptoms, and that meant they could have spread to other people. So about 25% of Canadians who tested positive for antibodies due to previous infection had no symptoms and could have unknowingly been spreading the virus. This really reinforces how important the physical distancing measures and mask wearing have been, particularly before vaccine rollout, but I think they have a role to play going forward too. Next slide, please. So the Statistics Canada results, they help us understand the results from other task force funded studies. They kind of provide almost like a framework. We see this trend in infection acquired immunity in Canada. This is to February the 18th, 2021 of 4.2% with a 95% confidence interval 3.5 to 5.0. Next, please. Next slide, yes. So I do wanna draw your attention to Zero Tracker. Zero Tracker you can find on our website and it's mapping global zero prevalence data. And it serves our need for the, the testing data that uh, we, we want to look at to compare with other countries. And it's supported by the task force. The key finding is that in 2020, national zero prevalence estimates globally are low. And if you want to know more, there's been a systematic review and meta-analysis conducted by the zero tracker team, and you can find it here. But the median zero prevalence overall, 74 countries, 9.3 million people was 4.6%. Next slide, please. So, the results that uh, in CIS supported studies, I just want to put this in general, um, immunity from infection clearly is not going to be enough. Vaccines are critical, as we know, especially when we're faced with variants such as Delta, which are lowering a little bit the vaccine effectiveness. Um, SARS-CoV-2 infection has been more commonly found in visible minority communities, in poorer neighborhoods, in public facing occupational groups and in younger age groups. And so efforts must continue to increase the vaccination rates in these populations. And we are hopefully seeing that across the country now. Next slide, please. So this just looks at data from the Canadian Blood Services. So you can see between June 2020 and January 2021, the huge increases. On the far left are the least materially deprived neighborhoods. In orange are the most materially deprived neighborhoods. In purple are the white population. And in dark teal would be other racialized group minority Canadians. 
And when you look to see what's happened by January 2021, you see that the most materially deprived neighborhoods and those with more minority Canadians have the highest zero prevalence rates. Next, please. So serial surveys continue to be important in measuring waning immunity. Um, we want to be sure that we get the timing of a booster if one is required right by measuring waning immunity and for looking at infections that occur despite a previous infection or despite being fully immunized to see what kinds of variants are underlying those. We call them sometimes breakthrough infections. Next slide, please. But I do, before I go, want to let you know a little bit about the dried blood spot antibody testing. There were some questions in the chat about it. So what the task force did was to initiate the idea of doing a validation of dried blood spots. As you may know, dried blood spots are used in low-income countries and in other settings where you need a specimen that can be transported easily, where it doesn't require going to a clinic to give blood, to do a blood draw, venipuncture, and maybe where you, you don't have centrifugation. So we conducted a multi-center, multi-assay specimen equivalency study. It was coordinated by the National Microbiology Laboratory in Winnipeg. The sites that part participated were in Vancouver, Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal, and Winnipeg. We were comparing commercial assays against made in Canada bespoke assays using natural research council antigens. And they performed best, and we're gonna show you a little bit about them, but they are from the laboratories of Anne-Claude Gingra in Toronto and Marc-André Langlois in Ottawa. So dried blood spot testing permits obtaining more representative samples and increasing the participation. And we've used them not only in StatCan, but in pediatric studies, indigenous peoples, CANPATH, correctional settings, and many others. Next, please. Hi, I'm Marc-André Langlois head of the Langlois Laboratory at the University of Ottawa. Hello, I am Anne-Claude Gingras, head of the Gingras Laboratory at Sinai Health in Toronto. It's important to know how many Canadians have antibodies to SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. As this suggests, they have some form of immunity. Testing for antibodies with dried blood spot kits has proven to be a highly effective way to test blood samples from hundreds of thousands of Canadians all over the country. Both of our laboratories are among those that have played a very important role in analyzing the dry blood spot samples shipped from all over Canada. We have both developed essays that test for the presence of antibodies to the SARS-CoV-2 virus. These essays have already been used on more than 100,000 samples from across the country. An at-home collection kit is an easy way to collect blood from large numbers of people. The participants simply pricks their own finger with a lancet and applies the blood onto a filter card that has five circles. Once dry, the card is then mailed back to the lab for analysis. The first step is then to punch small three millimeter discs from a spot using a semi-automated puncher that transfers two of these punches into a single well of a 96 well plate. A buffer solution is added to each well to release the antibodies from the dry blood punch. These antibodies are further diluted by a technician and transferred to an automated platform. Each sample is checked for the presence of antibodies against three different SARS-CoV-2 proteins. These proteins are produced in large quantities by the National Research Council of Canada. Using three different SARS-CoV-2 proteins not only increases the specificity or exactness of the test, but it allows scientists to accurately determine if a person has antibodies due to a previous SARS-CoV-2 infection, or due to vaccination, or both. Each system can perform between 3,800 to more than 4,800 individual tests per day. The automated instrumentation performs each step of the experimental procedure using a liquid handler that has specific reagents at different points. The last reagent added will emit light if antibodies are present in the sample. At the final stage, the plates are read in a detector. 
the amount of light detected tells how many antibody to SARS-CoV-2 proteins are present in the sample. Our two teams have worked closely with the National Microbiology Laboratory, the COVID-19 Immunity Task Force, and the National Research Council to create this Made in Canada solution. This work helps us better understand the spread and impact of the virus among Canadians and their immune response to vaccination. Fantastic. Thank you very much. I think we can uh, start the Q&A session now. Is there any uh, final comments from the expert panel? I just would like to say, Susan, just what a pleasure it has been to work with Statistics Canada, amazing statistical expertise, world renowned. And these two laboratories, they've been absolutely excellent partners. Oh, that's fantastic to hear. I think that's one of the opportunities that uh, COVID-19 has presented to everyone is a, a fantastic new way of collaborating and, uh, and culture amongst scientists, which has just been fabulous. So yeah, congratulations to you and the team. It's just been a, a wonderful presentation and, and it, clearly incredible amounts of work and a very thoughtful process. So thank you, everyone. Um, so let's get to the questions now. Um, uh, with the, I'm not sure it was answered by the uh, short video, but was the with the dried blood spot test, how sensitive was the test, and how many and which antigens were used? Was that covered in the uh, short video then? Anyone on the panel can jump in. I think we also might have Anne Claude Jingra here as well, if she's allowed to speak. I saw her name earlier, I think. Oh, that would be terrific. I'll ask my colleague just look. to perhaps unmute her. Yeah, so thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So, um, yeah, I'm Anne Claude Jingra. I saw Marc André Langlois also on the call earlier. So, you may want to unmute him as well. So the, the question was about the different antigens that we're using, correct? And the sensitivity of the test? Yeah, so the sensitivity of the test has been independently established by Marc-André and my team using uh, uh, groups of both negative samples. So those were people that were whose blood was acquired prior to 2019. So, you know, assumed to be negative for SARS-CoV-2 and samples of people with confirm, PCR confirmed uh, infection. So this is essentially how we've set up the test. So our own essay has been published in uh, Sense Immunology last fall. So I'm happy to circulate that uh, uh, across the team member. But essentially, each essay has been uh, defined for um, sensitivity and specificity characteristic using these 300 or 400 positive samples and the same number of negative samples. So we've done that uh, on each essay. And one thing that was not may be clear in the little movie that we presented is each in each essay, we also have a calibrant that is also a synthetic standard that is provided by the NRC, so that each essay is normalized to the synthetic calibrant so that the essays that we do today will have the same uh, uh, calibration as the essay that we will do in one month. And again, marc is using exactly the same antigen, exactly the same reagent, and exactly the same calibrant. So that means that the essays that he generates in his lab are normalized to the same standard as we do. And I think that's quite uh, unique in terms of, of uh, homemade essays that, that we're really using all of the same resources. So I don't know if that really answers the question that was asked in this chat, but if uh, anybody has a further question, I, I'm happy to answer. I'm sure marc will would be as well. Marc-André, are you there? Would you like to contribute to that answer? Um, no, uh, and Claude covered the, uh, the topic uh, very well. Uh, I'd like to reiterate that we're using exactly the same reagents for the, uh, the, uh, the same antigens for the assays uh, that are produced by the National Research Council and the same uh, synthetic calibrators uh, to, um, to be able to scale the data. 
So uh, theoretically, the, the, our assays are, are nearly identical in terms of uh, sensitivity and uh, specificity. Great, thank you very much. And feel free to put links to the- any Susan, there was, oh. Susan, there was a question in the chat that was about uh, seasonal coronaviruses and whether they could uh, cross-react. I don't know if either Anne Claude or uh, Marc Andre want to respond to that. Thank you. Well, I, I, I can uh, I can jump in. Uh, yes, the seasonal coronaviruses uh, do cross-react to some extent. Uh, however, our cutoffs account for that cross-reactivity, and, and therefore there there is a a, a certain um, uh, room for uh, for the effect of uh, seasonal coronaviruses that are generally lower than uh, than one percent of cross-reactivity. And maybe I can just comment on that as well, that our decision to uh, call based on two out of three antigen for positivity was based on us looking at a lot of samples of known positive and known negatives and essentially figuring out that when there is a cross reactivity, um, it doesn't tend to be on more than one antigen. So in fact, we haven't detected any obvious cross uh, reactivity in pre-COVID uh, samples. Uh, if we made that call based on two antigens. So that was a little bit of a decision to increase a little bit the stringency because you don't want to overcall seroprevalence uh, in, in those studies. So, so this, this was something that we decided. So the, the values themselves are scored individually, right? So we have an essay for spike, we have an essay for RBD, and then we have an essay for the nucleocapsid. And each of those values are calibrated, you know, internally. And of course we get, we get not only just positivity, but we actually get real value. And then we set it, select the cutoff for reporting within each essays. And then the final call is made uh, based on that, that um, uh, a little bit of a binary call that you have to be positive in two out of those three essays. Thank you. So we'll just work through the questions one by one and see how far we get. We do have till 5.30, so thanks everyone. And I'll just invite panelists who feel um, able to respond to jump in. So next question is, how did you correct for the shorter duration of nu nuclear capsid antibodies when you sorted vaccine-induced and infection-acquired immune response? That's probably a question for Stephen, right? Stephen? Um, unfortunately, I don't have an answer to that question. Um, our interpretation of the data was simply based off of the positive or negative or indeterminate status. Um, so I, I wouldn't have an answer as to uh, the, uh, the effect of uh, what was mentioned. Okay, thanks. Maybe I can comment a little bit. So we've, we've looked at a time course in our essays. Again, like all of these people that we had in our positive control at the beginning were all symptomatic. So take that with a little bit of a grain of salt. But what we can tell you is that in that symptomatic cohort, in the first four months of infection, um, uh, people that, 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 that were infected still had antibodies that were well beyond the detectable level with uh, antibodies to nucleocapsid, RBD, and spike beyond this, this time period, and, and, and this is true that the nucleocapsid dropped a little bit faster than, than, than uh, spike in particular. So beyond this period, so somebody that got infected, say in April 2020, whether they still have circulating nucleocapsid uh, that's beyond our, detect our detection site, you know, a year later, that's unclear, right? So it could very well be that this contributes to a little bit of the underestimation of the seroprevalence based on um, the, the number of known PCR positive, right? You do have waning immunity. This is not just going to affect nucleocapsid, but RBD as well, and to a lesser extent spike. So this by all means uh, can contribute to, to a little bit of an underestimation of older infections. Thank you. Uh, did you have the actual serological teeter or any measure of AB concentration for each serum sample? I imagine teeters for vaccine-induced immunity were much higher for all three antigens. Macandre, you should take that one. Oh, I, I just I got agree to because you had a high spike. <laughs> uh, I just got unmuted, so. Uh... We, we didn't, um, 
we could theoretically uh, convert to, to titers. Um, we, we haven't done that. Uh, this was a seroprevalence study. There is a, uh, a certain challenge measuring titers from dried blood spots. Um, to be able to do it in, in a significant way, uh, the saturation of those uh, cards needs to be nearly all identical if we want to compare the, uh, the, the titers. And this is not always the case. There's some variability in the quality of these um, uh, dried blood spots. So for, for this study, we didn't actually look at the titers. Yeah, just, just to comment though, we have an idea of the measure of the amount of antibody just based on you know the signal that we detect, right? So, and uh, the I, I guess it's Dr. Franco that that asked uh, whether the vaccine induced immunity is higher for the three antigen. So it's higher for two of the antigen, right? The ARBD and the spike, not for the nucleocapsid, but it is much higher. And in doubly vaccinated individual, it is uh, so high that it essentially capped the version of the essay that we use for the Statistics Canada survey. So, so it, the, this is actually a very pertinent question. Thank you. Next question. What percentage of the survey population was partially or fully vaccinated, but did not have detectable antibodies? Um, so I can provide a response to that question. So uh, I, unfortunately, I don't have the number in front of me now, but what I can say it was, was that it was not 100%, and it was not close to 100%, but there's one giant caveat to uh, presenting those numbers, and that's the amount of time between the vaccination and then the, the completing the test. So we looked at individuals that were, had reported being vaccinated, but were seronegative. And what we uncovered was that there was a median day, a medium time of approximately seven days in between when they had uh, received their vaccine and when they had completed the test. We know just based on uh, uh, general reports in the media that uh, generally antibodies are developed two to three weeks after initial vaccination. So these numbers do make sense. We'll move on to the next question. A 2.6% infection acquired rate seems much too low. About 4% of the entire population of Canada have been reported to have tested positive with COVID-19 based on PCR tests. This should provide an underestimate. CDC estimated that the number of actual cases of COVID-19 is about five times higher than tested positive with the PCR tests. This would indicate that SARS-CoV-2 antibodies should be in at least 20 to 25% of the Canadian population. Comments? You can respond in part to that, I think, Susan. Okay. Um, so the ratio between true infection and confirmed cases uh, has been changing over time. So uh, it was much higher at the start of the pandemic, of course, when there were challenges with testing capacity. Uh, but the estimate coming from our model suggests it's close to a ratio of, of just under two right now is what our model suggests. So, um, you know, I think it, you have to look at that uh, over time and be a little careful about what date you're looking at. But I think it's a good idea, though, to do those back of the envelope calculations and ensure that you know what we're seeing is consistent. And in some sense, that's what the modeling work is trying to do. It's trying to pull together these zero survey results along with epidemiologic indicators, and trying to find uh, and ensure some consistency amongst them in terms of the estimate it provides. Great, thanks, David. On slide 22, I think that was one of your slides, Stephen. Uh, could you please discuss the error bars as well as what they mean in terms of results validity? Uh, yeah, certainly. So um, this is one of the limitations that we did expect from a low prevalence estimate survey. And uh, part of the reason why uh, we have these large estimates is because the country as a whole, generally speaking, has been quite good at limiting the spread of the disease within the population. Uh, so what we did was we looked at these point estimates and compared them to other surveys which were available. And David, uh, Dr. Buckridge spoke to that a little bit about, uh, for example, CBS and HQ and Hemo-Quebec data. And we did notice that these results for the most part lined up with what other surveys uh, had provided us. Uh, the other thing to, that's important to note is that uh, Statistics Canada took a generally a more conservative approach when uh, calculating the confidence intervals that surround the estimates. And that was including uh, the sensitivity and the specificity of the estimate and how it may have impact, impacted these, uh, these zero prevalence estimates. So part of the reason why you see these, uh, these wider zero prevalence estimates is that, again, uh, Statistics Canada is being a bit more conservative about uh, the estimate in general, uh, considering the sensitivity and the specificity of the test. 
Okay, good. Thank you. From Joy, do you have the antigen data irrespective of whether they answered the EQ? That is just an overall general number for the antibody test. Was it different from a sample with those who answered the EQ? Um, so I can answer that one as well. Unfortunately, we don't have the information for those who did not answer the EQ. And the reason for that was simply that uh, individuals answering the EQ were also asked a series of consent questions, including the, the consent to have the test completed on their sample. So if we did not have explicit consent from the individual, from their electronic questionnaire, we did not go ahead with an analysis of their test. Uh, so the data that we do have really speaks to those people that ended up in our final estimates. Thanks, Stephen. Did you ask about gender in the survey? Your results show only sex. Uh, yes, we did. We asked for sex at birth as well as gender. Uh, for the uh, for health surveys in general at Statistics Canada, we usually talk about uh, sex at birth. However, that does not preclude someone from being able to do an analysis on gender as well. Thank you. From Christine, are the proportions of Aboriginal and visible minority groups representative of these groups for all of Canada and each of the provinces and territories? Uh, so I can answer that in part for certainly. Um, again, this kind of goes back to that uh, look at the confidence intervals surrounding the data that is broken down. Uh, so the, the data that we provided uh, in, the, in the presentation were overall national estimates for the visible minority population as well as the, uh, the Indigenous population within Canada. And uh, breaking results down past that level of detail uh, it becomes very difficult because we simply run out of seropositive sample for which to do a, a valid analysis. Um, so one of, the, one of the, the, the requirements under the statistics acts for us as analysts is that we not publish results when the seropositive, no, the number of seropositives or the number of the numerator basically is less than five. And so that was one of the things that really constrained us for producing some of these results past a national estimate. When you break it out by provinces and territories, you start to run into very small counts from which we could not derive, uh, derive estimates for those regions. Thank you. Next question, I'm not sure if this was fully covered by your answer, I think it was David. Uh, how do you explain that seroprevalence results are lower or similar than the actual rate of PCR confirmed infections at the end of February, 2021, at least in Quebec? considering that not all infected people were PCR tested? Uh, I'm not sure exactly what figures are being referred to, but as I said, generally speaking in our model results, we're showing that the uh, estimated cumulative serial conversion is generally higher than the confirmed cases by a ratio. It depends on where you look in time, but uh, the lowest we've got is just under two, which suggests that for every person who's confirmed, there's another person uh, on average, that is not confirmed by PCR testing. So our results would not go in that direction, they go in the other direction. Okay, thank you. Since the results with the spike protein, there should have been more positive results than with the RBD. Is this the case? If not, then this calls into question whether the dry blood test is sensitive enough. Surely it would have been better to test for additional markers than just the spike or nucleocapsid protein. There are 27 proteins encoded by the SARS-CoV-2 genome. So maybe I can just comment that indeed uh, spike always uh, yield uh, more than RBD. Uh, and that's true across all the studies, either it's uh, vaccination study or infection studies. So what we notice is we tend to get an earlier response to spike than we do with RBD. So a couple of days ahead in the case of vaccination or infection and, and the levels of anti-spike antibody last longer. So, so I agree with, with you. That's S. Pelek, that's probably Steve Pelek. Uh, so I agree with you, Steve. Um, there are other proteins uh, that, that are encoded by the SARS-CoV-2 gene. What we wanted was assays that essentially would use antigen that would uh, give a, a really high uh, 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 seroprevalence. So we could have done a combinatorial approach, adding to it like things like off tree that also raises uh, some, some um, uh, positives uh, or the uh, membrane protein or envelope but none of them uh, gives us a uh, really uh, good uh, sensitivity and specificity. So we felt that, you know, when we made a decision to make a test, we 
up to three antigen that would com in combination give us a lot of information. So spike is the most sensitive and it is very, very specific. Um, it just also turns out that this is what all the vaccines are com uh, comprising. We wanted the RBD for specificity and we wanted the RBD for potential function in terms of blocking the interaction with uh, ACE2, for example. And then we wanted to have another antigen that was not part of spike and, and clearly the nucleocapsid is the most immunoreactive of all of those 27 proteins encoded by the SARS-CoV-2 genome. So could we do better if we had a few more antigen? Absolutely. But we made a little bit of a, um, a cost-benefit analysis to say, like, if we're going to profile that many samples, we can't possibly run all of the antigens at the same time on so many samples. So, um, so just uh, take that with a grain of salt. It could have been maybe even a little bit more sensitive if we had a model that that took more into consideration, but we really felt that this was giving us actually a very good um, uh, analysis of the response to both vaccination and infection in large number of samples. And, and we note that RSA, we didn't develop for dry blood spot, right? So we developed it for serum and plasma sample initially, and then adapted it to the dry blood spots. So, so this, is, this is something that needs to be kept in mind. This was not just a DBS assay. So we've been able to do that on several different types of samples. Thank you, Anclet. S2 can drive full-length S signal and antibodies from other common coronavirus cross-react with both SARS-CoV-2, S2, and N. If positive is based on two of three signals, this could account for false positive. Was the presence of common coronavirus AB considered or measured? That's probably a better question for Marc-André, who's done a lot of work on on seasonal coronavirus net. Yes, hi. Uh, no, we, we didn't uh, specifically analyze the, the seasonal coronaviruses uh, on these samples. Uh, we, we do uh, regularly uh, study the, uh, the cross-reactivity to seasonals uh, in our other studies, but uh, th this was not done systematically here. Thank you. Question from Jane, why the error bars for age below 19 years are larger than other age groups? And it was answered by David Buckridge. There are far fewer deaths in younger age groups resulting in greater uncertainty in the estimated infection fatality ratio. So anything yeah, I assume, like that, I assume that was a question related to the plot of the infection fatality ratio I showed. So, but if not, oh, please, uh, uh, someone can chime in and we'll, we'll provide more details. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Anybody com want to comment on that? No? Okay, we'll move on then. Is it possible to identify hot spots or hot activities or occupations to inform preventive measures? Uh, yeah, that's certainly something that is possible to be done. Uh, aside from the data file, which is available in the research data centers uh, at Statistics Canada, we also have a postal code file. It's a six digit postal code, which is also available. Uh, there are a few more restrictions in use for that uh, for the use of that file. Uh, the researcher has to identify specifically what they intend to do with the analysis. Um, and uh, to, to speak to, uh, what is the question here? Activities and occupations. So uh, when respondents asked, uh, or when respondents indicated that they'd worked in direct contact with others, we followed up with uh, questions regarding what type of occupation they did. Uh, and so we do have information uh, among people who reported working in direct contact with others about what their occupation is. This information was coded to, uh, I believe it was uh, National, uh, North American Occupational Classification System 2016. It's a system used by Statistics Canada that breaks down uh, occupations based on classification. So for example, we will be able to provide more analysis about occupations, for example, the healthcare industry. And that's actually something we're working on now for a late summer or early fall release. So the next question is, how does the minority data separate out amongst East Asians, South Asians, and Africans in Canada? Uh, so we do have that information as well. However, we begin to run into uh, problems with very small sample sizes. So I can give you one example of that that I have off the top of my head. So uh, one of the, uh, the population groups 
in our question was uh, for individuals who identified as Black only. And in that group, we have a, an estimate of approximately 9.2%. However, that estimate is based off of a seropositive sample of just 14 people and, uh, and, and a, total, uh, estim a total sample of just over 100 people. So it's, uh, we have those numbers, but it's important to remember that when you, when you look at the number of seropositive individuals, of after, on which we're basing these estimates, it's really difficult to kind of take that number and then say that this is the number. Uh, it's going to have very wide confidence intervals around it. Thanks. Uh, web address of reports. Where's the best place to go? To your website, I presume? Yeah, I just put that in the chat, actually, uh, Susan. Um, they can go to COVID-19 Immunity Task Force uh, The modeling, I'm not sure what reports they're talking about exactly. The modeling reports, I'm presuming, they're not up yet, but they will be up soon. So um, they can keep on checking. And if uh, you can always post them on our social media. So if you follow us on, on Twitter or Facebook, LinkedIn or Instagram, um, we'll be able to sort of put a shout out once they're up. Okay, thanks. Back to blood spot tests. How does it perform on blood samples from people that have been infected with SARS-CoV-2 more than four months before? It may be that this test just works on people that have been recently infected due to poor sensitivity. Maybe I can just comment briefly. We, we covered that a little bit before, but uh, it is true that there will be waning immunity. And again, like, you know, we've looked at the kinetics of decay in antibodies in people that have been infected with the limitation that most of our data points are in symptomatic individuals. And from studies across the world, the world I participate to the WHO serology group meetings. What really seems to happen is that the uh, non-symptomatic uh, asymptomatic people seem to be uh, losing uh, uh, antibodies to bring them below the detection limit at uh, not a faster rate, but faster in, in terms of, you know, numbers of months than symptomatic individuals. So we still have symptomatic individuals that were infected very early on during the first waves uh, that still have a uh, high level of, of uh, antibodies against all of our antigens. So, so I think this is going to be this is a tricky question, right? So of course, we're going to lose sensitivity. I mean, it's not that the SA is not sensitive, but it's the antibodies are dropping below a certain detection limit. Um, and I think that's that's going to be the case for any SA that, that we look at. But we don't think that our SAs are particularly sensitive. And in fact, our nucleocapsid SA detects antibody uh, much longer than what has been shown for the Abbott assay that has a rapid waning. That's not necessarily nucleocapsid specific, but whatever Abbott is using as an antigen in their in their kit. Great. Thank you. From Vicky, is it not a misnomer to suggest that you are measuring prevalence of vaccine mediated immunity at this point? The threshold set in the lab does not indicate immunity. The threshold is necessary to assess whether there is evidence that antibodies against the antigen are present at a level distinguishable from the uninfected or unvaccinated population, but the antibody uh, titers are often still quite low after a single dose of vaccine. The vaccines were approved as two dose regimens because efficacy is much higher after the second dose. No comments? Anyone on the panel? Yeah, it's a difficult one to reply to because in that period of time, December to the end of March, early April, um, the people who had vaccines, depending on what province they were in, there might have been a different interval between the two. So uh, maybe Stephen, you can say how many people actually, I think I'm pretty sure we only had first dose vaccine in the survey. Is that correct, Stephen? Uh, with very few exceptions, yes, that was mostly the case. Thank you. Some nice feedback from Gerald Evans. Great work and very useful results to inform policy and in action. Thank you. And there's, uh, thank you, there's the uh, a web link there. Um, we have a couple of comments from, I think, Steve. I'm going to 
jump, I'll come back to those just to give other people an opportunity here. Congratulations for tremendous progress in completing the CCHS, establishing the DBA methods and modeling to project uh, current, project current immunity levels. A suggestion question, with the same methods being applied in CANPATH on approximately 20,000 cohort participants across all provinces, there will be comprehensive covariate data available to the research community that reaches beyond and complements CCAHS's population-based prevalent uh, estimates. Is there a plan to include additional covariate structures into the modeling to capture variation across communities? I can take this question, Susan. Uh, so thank you very much, John, for the comment. And uh, yes, that's a, definitely the plan. Uh, as part of the work of the um, CITF Secretariat, we're working with all the funded studies to help uh, them collect certain core data elements in a consistent way that will then be shared with the CITF Secretariat, uh, which will allow us to do two things. One, it will be used in our modeling work exactly uh, as the question asks, so that we can uh, dig deeper into these sort of co covariance and these relationships between some of the, the characteristics that are, are influencing immunity. Uh, the second thing, and we'll be doing that work, uh, I should mention, uh, conjunction with other modelers across the country, we've established a, a modeling table uh, where we have routine meetings and discussions around methods of modeling seroprevalence. Uh, the other way those data will be used is that the uh, CITF will be putting in place a data access committee to allow other researchers to request access to the data that have been shared with uh, the CITF, so they can also conduct secondary research. Great. And a question from Christine. Wouldn't a hotspot analysis fall under the confidentiality clause and thus become impossible to do due to the probably low number of survey participants living within the same postal code? Uh, yes, uh, definitely. So uh, I, I was thinking more along the lines of looking at all hotspots within a geographic region, for example, a province or even within the country. Perfect, thanks. Question from Joy. We hire risk populations. We need broader solutions addressing social determinants of health that in and of itself would improve overall health outcomes due to better working and living environments and also increase vaccine up, uptake, uh, uptake probably, uh, update. Any comments in, in response to Joy's comment there? Just to say that I think um, almost everyone on this call would agree with this. Uh, if we don't address the social determinants of health, we're not gonna have improved health outcomes, whether that's COVID, maternal health, child health, everything. Mm -hmm. Uh, Susan, maybe I could just add to that. I think if we put this also in the perspective of the earlier data we had from the Canadian Blood Services back in May, for May, June of 2020, we saw at that time that the uh, uh, socio social uh, gradients were not quite as uh, pronounced. And so what's particularly concerning is that over the course of the trajectory of the pandemic, it has become, it's grown much more quickly in, in those populations, racialized communities and, and, and uh, uh, neighborhoods that are materially deprived. And so in some respects, we've watched this evolve over time uh, and not addressed it um, uh, clearly as proactively as we should have. So, uh, to me, this is uh, this is particularly humbling and concerning evidence for all of us in the public health community who are concerned about social determinants of health. Thanks. Thanks, Tim. Another comment from Christine. Also, postal codes cover very large areas in rural regions. Geolocalization of participants addresses and identification. Uh, the dissemination areas yields results that are much more precise. INSPQ does this for vaccination and case data, although the data is not available to the public. That's just a comment. So from Abraham, from a policy perspective, as we start to list public health, uh, lift public health measures, what may be some key indicators from the CITF perspective that may support the re-implementation of public health measures due to a possible delta to driven resurgence, also considering a large portion of Canadians will be vaccinated. So key indicators. Tim, do you want to respond to this? Because I think what we're seeing across the country 
uh, an agreement that we would be looking um, at hospitalization, severe illness, ICU deaths, et cetera, um, looking to see how many infections are actually occurring that are symptomatic and the PCR testing rate. So I think there are a number of different indicators. Um, I don't know if there is consensus among the provinces about which indicators are gonna drive public policy in provinces. Tim, did you wanna reply? Yeah, sorry, I'm just slow on the manual dexterity. Um, uh, but uh, I think it is a good question. And I think uh, it, it's more fundamentally a question, not, not simply about immune surveillance, which is the primary um, uh, mandate of the task force, uh, but also um, COVID-19 surveillance, public health surveillance. And, and my own personal view on this is that given uh, the Delta uh, variant and the, the risk of escape, uh, but also uh, we had an interesting meeting with chief medical officers of health um, uh, late last week uh, in which uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, chief medical officers were saying, how do we manage the fact that over the course of the next year, 400,000 uh, people will arrive in Canada um, and will of undetermined vaccine vaccination status or different types of vaccination status. And so I think if you combine that with variants and also plateauing of coverage and also patchy coverage of, of, of a vaccination across the country, um, then uh, the importance of continued public health surveillance, uh, including active, uh, a testing for acute infection, both asymptomatic and symptomatic, uh, but also immune surveillance, uh, for, uh, particularly from the perspective on, of understanding uh, issues of breakthrough, um, uh, perhaps uh, driven by variants, uh, as well as um, waning infection, uh, or populations that are um, uh, perhaps immunocompromised for one reason or another. Uh, I think this all um, bodes or suggests that we need to continue to have a very active public health surveillance as part of our of what we go forward with. And I think the biggest mistake we can make is to think somehow because we reach some magic threshold of the numbers vaccinated, that somehow we don't have to continue that vigilance. Uh, I would say that that would be premature. So I think it's a great question, um, but I, my, my general response would be in addition to what Kate said, we need to have a, a, a full court press on surveillance um, uh, until we're clearly um, beyond variance and, and down to uh, uh, a much more stable trajectory in this pandemic. To questions about vaccine passports and things as well. <laughs> I think we can talk about that another day. Uh, a couple more comments now. Um, the 110 SARS CoV 2 peptide marker spot membrane test that we've developed at Connexus shows very profound differences in immunoreactivity between COVID 19 PCR confirmed cases. Yet over a year later, with the same participants, we find the pattern is remarkably similar. I think the dried blood spot test is really underestimating natural immunity by an order of magnitude. And a second comment, we find that antibodies against the membrane protein give the most consistent robot, robust responses better than any other SARS-CoV-2 antigens. Uh, any comments from the panel in response? I'll just maybe a little bit of a comment that, that some of the difference, uh, and that's been reported in other groups as well, that use uh, peptide array. And I think the antigenicity of peptides and whole folded protein is a little bit different. So just uh, to remind everybody on the call, we've been using actually protein that are all produced in mammalian cells uh, by Yves de Rocher. Actually, we should have named them earlier. Uh, National Research uh, Council of Canada. So, so it's very possible uh, uh, that that you know the pattern of what we capture and the pattern that what is captured by looking at at array peptide is a little bit different in that respect. Great, thank you. You've uh, the team has received a number of kudos here. I won't read them out, but congratulations again, everyone. 
Um, and I've also had a question about whether or not the recording will be available. And yes, it will be available. It's posted uh, within a few days uh, on our Can COVID website, uh, and everybody will uh, can receive it there. Or we also send a note out through our newsletter uh, that it's available. Uh, question from Bonita. Many thanks to all the organizers. Very much appreciated. And thanks to all the questions. Uh, from Alexandra, has the Canadian Blood Services data around racialized folks and those living in material deprived neighborhoods been published in an academic journal? Can you provide a link? Anyone on this panel able to provide a link? I can provide a link to our news release about it and in the news release is a link to their report, but it is um, a report to the CITF. It is not uh, a report to an academic journal. Yeah, um, I just, um, I'm not aware that they have submitted anything for publication at the moment. Uh, and their CBS are pretty good at keeping us informed, uh, but we can inquire with, uh, uh, with Sheila O'Brien at CBS to know what their plans are with respect to publication. Great. And just a very general question uh, from me, actually, I'm just curious, once you're at this stage of reporting on uh, results of a large study, just any comments from the panel on anything you would have done differently or perhaps uh, uh, changed anything that you would have done or done something uh, that um, in response to uh, your findings now that you might have thought of earlier? I could maybe reply, you know, I think um, we certainly would have liked to have seen a higher participation rate. Um, the kits arrived in people's mailboxes and then they had to respond. Did they want to do this or not? So it wasn't that we had that Statistics Canada had a pre-existing relationship with the people that were chosen to be participants. Um, you know, I guess we could, in retrospect, think about more we could have done to increase participation in terms of social media and media coverage. We did quite a bit of media coverage, but I think we could have always done a bit more, perhaps. Thanks, Catherine. Tim or David? Jennifer, Steve? Uh, perhaps just to say that uh, Statistics Canada does employ follow-up procedures in attempting to boost the response rate. Um, uh, they do; these do go out mainly as in the forms of reminder, uh, reminder mail, as well as uh, non-response follow-up telephone calls in attempt to reach people. However, uh, if uh, this time round, uh, as it has, it has been the case in many uh, Statistics Canada surveys in recent years it's becoming more and more difficult to reach our targeted response rate uh, because uh, people are responding less and less as time goes by, unfortunately. Great, thanks, Steve. Tim? Yeah, um, I think um, it would have been great to have been able to do this last May, June following the first wave, uh, we were constrained by the absence of an approved test, uh, which is why we went through the DBS validation. Uh, there are other portable uh, tests that can be used at home, uh, but none of those had been authorized or had been uh, approved by Health Canada. Um, and so uh, we, we did the, D, the DBS validation. That took a little bit of time. Um, and, and I think we really missed the, uh, the first wave on this. So I think in the future, um, it would be good for us to try and move to um, periodic representatives um, uh, whole of Canada <laughs> sampling um, as soon as possible. And I think there's some valuable uh, lessons here on how we, uh, how we might do that. Uh, should we be confronted with something like this in the future? mobilize even faster <laughs> great okay well we're at time and a bit over actually i just want to say a huge round of thank yous to everyone who participated from the panel and everyone who joined us uh out there uh in the virtual world and stay safe everyone and have a wonderful summer we do take a bit of a break in august but uh, we still have some speaker series uh for the rest of july but just want to say thanks everyone fantastic session
Thanks very much, Susan. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for having us. We would like to thank our speakers and members of our network for their continued support and participation in Canada's pandemic response. If you are interested in learning more about CanCOVID or joining our pan-Canadian COVID-19 research network, please visit our website at www.cancovid.ca.